those attending the conference. Uh, we have people from all over the place, uh, coming from different countries and who were interested in this seminar. And you will see, therefore, that uh, we will have different languages. We will have simultaneous translation, and this will uh, contribute to the possibilities of cooperation between experts from different countries. Let me add that, as we've seen in the information that you have received, there's a LinkedIn group regarding these technologies, especially their use in the field of heritage and tourism, and that's the project that I was mentioning. So please join the network, and please do join uh, the discussion fora about uh, technologies, augmented reality, and mobile applications, something that we will discuss, discuss extensively this weekend. And we will also, sorry, this week, uh, we will also discuss other technologies which are useful for uh, heritage uh, purposes such as uh, mapping or virtual mapping. You will see that the Catalan government, the Generalitat government, has also called for uh, some subsidies uh, for mobile applications and augmented reality, including video mapping. And uh, if you're interested, please uh, check out the uh, conditions and uh, the, the conditions for the subsidy and uh, submit your proposals. And I would like to give the floor to Sergi Paul from the UPC, from the Polytechnic University of Barcelona, and I would like to thank the Idroscat Foundation as well, and, sorry, I2CAT I, uh, Foundation, and uh, he will tell you a little bit about this seminar, and then we will give the floor to the speaker. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good morning. I simply wanted to, re for those who will come this week, uh, the workshops, uh, for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, the workshop is going to take place in uh, a computer's room in the third place. You can use the computers at the school for the whole week. They have Unity, Blender, and so on. But if you want, you can also bring your computers uh, with those uh, apps. Uh, if you want to do augmented reality, it's better if you use your own device. At the school, we only have Windows. So if you have iOS, uh, you will not be able to develop and test it. So if you have a Mac with your license, I would like to recommend you to bring it over. If you can't bring your device but a portable phone, please do come because then you will have an integrated web ca webcam and you can test that. We don't have webcams at the school and you will not be able to test it. And if you don't have that, at least bring your webcam. And as we will have permission to install the drivers, you will also be able to test that. But just let me remind you that if you have your own devices, please do c bring them. And in that way, you will be able to take it home with the appropriate configuration. And now I would like to give the floor to the next, to today's speaker. Good morning and welcome. Jose Luis Eguia, uh, my name is Jose Luis Eguia. I would like to make a brief uh, introduction to augmented reality. I have uh, collected a number of cases which I have selected according to specific criteria because uh, I would like to discuss issues that go beyond technology and I would like to discuss uh, lots of things that have to do with augmented reality. This is a rather innovative or ra a, a relatively new technology and I can talk uh, in first person about uh, my own experiences in the development of this technology from the point of view of, um, from a professional point of view in the company and also from the university as a researcher. During the presentation, if you have any doubts, uh, please do interrupt me. Let me know. I will also ask you to get involved. I don't know how many of you have uh, mobile phones uh, and tablets. How many people have a tablet? How many of you have come from abroad? And have you, how many of you have you downloaded an app to visit Barcelona? Less. And how many of you, of those who uh, downloaded an app, uh, downloaded an augmented reality app to visit Barcelona? That's weird, isn't it? We're interested in augmented reality, but we're not using it that much. Let's have a look at uh, the most extended uh, definition of augmented reality, and let's see if we agree with this. It's taking reality and uh, overlapping information, which can be virtual, in order to augment it. And do we really augment the feeling, the sensations that come? 
to us? Do we really need uh, to augment the experiences that we live? Do you have an answer for that? Any answers? We increase the information. Uh, and is that enriching for us, that increase of informa that increased information? If it's well done. So today's presentation, and I hope that in the end we will have enough ideas and threads uh, that will uh, entice us to think about these apps that, that will improve things uh, and you, to find useful cases, useful like, examples uh, of uh, augmented reality. I studied physics, uh, but then at uh, some point in time, I shifted and I went to fine arts. When I was doing fine arts, that was a relatively big change, and we were reading about uh, artistic experiences and how to interact with the environment, performances, and so on. I studied one case uh, by Morton Haling. In some augmented reality books, uh, he is considered to be the first example of that. The idea is that if we take the story of cinema, this is very few years after technic color, the introduction of color in the cinema. That's where we, uh, we had already introduced movement. We added uh, color. And then somebody else said, why don't we add smells? Smells and we make it a more comprehensive experience. Uh, this man created this capsule, which was sold as a multi-sensorial experience, where would the, he would include sound, uh, images, smell, and so on to capture reality. That concern has lasted over time. We've always tried uh, to capture reality through drawings, through painting, and so on. And then somebody else came over and said, what if I add a video clips uh, in front of people's eyes, a video clip that I'm recording somewhere else? This uh, gentleman here created an artifact which helped us visualize video clips that were being recorded somewhere else. And his experience was highly clarifying. He took a camera and he was recording from the roof of a building. And then somebody inside a room was receiving this 3D image, and a stereoscopic image in video. And he was recording a basketball game. And the person in the room was uh, following the movements of the ball with their head. How many of you don't do like this when you drive a car and you, and you take a corner? We don't have inertia, and there's no reason why we should move the body. However, our body is reacting in such a way. And he saw that this gentleman was doing the same. And when the camera was looking at, at well, downstairs uh, at uh, the vacuum, uh, the person uh, got frightened. So there was a way to interfere or influence the way we perceive things. Uh, this invention uh, was uh, further developed, uh, but technology was uh, not that progressive at the time, and the hard work surrounding this augmented reality experience was still very poor, and it didn't allow them to do something mobile. During the 1980s, that technology was further developed, and in the 1990s, for the first time, we see the appearance of the term augmented reality. Boeing was using that technology to replace uh, the uh, cabling structures which had to be there physically in order to have a reference for the person who was manipulating and setting up different devices. And he thought, and at Boeing, they thought, if we can do something virtual, we can do, we can, we can lay that over uh, the device while the cables are being uh, assembled. That was a fantastic idea. It wasn't only Boeing. At the but it wasn't only for corporations, but at the military, they decided to do something similar as well. In the 1990s, uh, we had films such as Stroll or a film that I was uh, heavily influenced by, which was the grass uh, moaner. Or the grass moaner, has anyone seen that? that? Or the lawn moaner. A gentleman, based on the use of virtual world, he became almost like a semi-god to the end to the point that he could destroy his environment and kill people and so on. There's a very sad ending to that film. But in any case, that conveyed the idea Uh, at that time, uh, science uh, magazines were talking about uh, the development of things such as hands that would allow us uh, to convey or to collect data and transfer them to the uh, virtual world, uh, glasses that were able to 
to project things, uh, dresses full of sensors and so on, but very few practical, useful actions besides what we saw from Boeing and uh, from the military for pilots, for instance, fighter pilots. So these are other attempts uh, of augmented reality, but being projected, in this case, not projecting this on the observer, but rather creating an environment. At that time, I was studying drawing, and when I found out I was doing fine art, fine art at that time, many years after this technology was created. And the first time I read about this in a book, while I was sculpting a stone, a piece of stone, I had the feeling that the feelings that the sound of the piece of stone and the carving was creating, compared with this little experience, became extremely, well, felt extremely poor. Of course, this was only the beginning, but this, in the late 1990s, uh, for those who are technology lovers uh, will know Ibo, a robot developed by Sony. Sony's president uh, thought that in the next uh, years, uh, the key would be personal robots. How many of you have something that, um, for instance, an eye robot that is uh, hovering the floor. Quite a few people do have some of these little devices that are helping you with housework. But the IBO last, did not last for long. They closed down that research line after a few years. Others recovered that. But one of the things that uh, the Japanese uh, learned in this robotics development and something that has recurrently reappeared in television experiences is that human beings, uh, while they are standing in front of a device, uh, especially a device which needs to be to feel close to them, if it has human traits, humanoid traits, uh, a certain empathy is awakened. It will feel familiar with Toy Story mm, Muppets, uh, but when you come close to this experience, which is uh, similar to reality, but not exactly reality, we have the uncertainty valley. If it comes too close, to, we will feel rejection to that technology. Probably, if you've seen uh, those news that talk about new advances in Japanese robotics, and when you see a human being who talks uh, and has similar facial gestures uh, or face gestures uh, similar to humans, and that creates a, a funny feeling. Have you experienced that ever? Only if we have a 100% approach to reality, we feel comfortable and everybody enjoys watching the journals, uh, magazines, and films where we have those beings which are like real. Augmented reality. Well, there's something similar in this case, too. If we don't have a 100% approach to sound, for those who have worked with uh, with text readers, you will have uh, uh, realized that if realism is not close to 100%, we feel uncomfortable from that ex minimum experience uh, that we started with. Technology has evolved. Uh, we now have um, surrounding environments. We have even 360 degrees. And we also have 3D, so we have uh, this in-depth vision. In the car industry, for instance, for developing cars uh, to check the feelings that cars could have, uh, this type of systems have been used. This has also been used in uh, education, but it's not something that has come to the general population. People don't go and spend a week in, in the augmented reality uh, rooms. And the first time I saw that uh, being used passively was uh, uh, when we saw uh, the appearance of systems such as the art toolkit, something that was created at the university and was uh, aimed at the university where in the late 1990s. This uh, art toolkits allowed anyone in a very simple way to connect a, web a webcam and to have an augmented reality experience with very f little experience. Have you ever had any experience with a toolkit like this? Art toolkit? Any. With which? 
Which one did you use? Was it good? Did you enjoy it? No. Yes? Any app which was uh, relatively useful, or was it only the, the first experience, a first approach to see how that behaved? We did a stage work. or a scene work. Is that a theater play, what you're talking about? Sorry, without a microphone, we can't really hear what the people in the audience are saying. That was still quite complex, a bit too complex. So probably people would uh, put it down f and wait until next year. But there are some updates and different elements that make that technology not really that that useful at that point in time, 2000. The year 2000, it was not that practical yet. I remember I was doing my PhD, and I remember one person in one of the presentations that we did in our talks, uh, that person came with a mark. We need uh, some references. Uh, uh, we can use geopositioning. But we could also use markers. And uh, they put that on the floor, and then they saw a cupboard. And people started to feel interested and to, uh, to start buying materials, buying hardware. Th some people bought some eyeglasses uh, uh, that cost uh, 3,000 euros uh, to see uh, five, well, uh, the equivalent of 50-inch screen. Uh, but only just a few inches from your eyes. Did you buy any of this? Did you test them, these glasses? And what was your experience when testing those eyeglasses? Two minutes after that, I was almost throwing up. I was one of the persons who was against uh, investing so much money in technology without having tested it in advance. So they brought the glasses there. And when they, when we got there, when they got there, we uh, put them, we assembled them, and uh, we all tested them. I got dizzy, and the second experience that I had is I wanted to stop it, and I was starting, well, where's the keyboard? It was almost like reduced uh, reality. I couldn't use the mouse, I couldn't use the keyboard, and well, once we all used them, they were put down, and I never heard about them again. Nothing was developed by with that. They didn't have depth. They were not 3D. They only had 50-inch uh, images, and their quality was worse than on uh, on a screen. Another interesting experience that I saw, rather remarkable, actually, came from Australia. Some people there had uh, taken those development kits, and they set up a space. I don't know if you've used Minecraft. Well, this is the old version of Minecraft. I go around the city and I play some elements around. And well, that's quite impactful the first time you see that. But does it have a practical use? For instance, allow me to ask you, in Jordan, for instance, where you have the wonders and uh, the museums and the landscapes, fantastic landscapes that you have. Uh, but do you think this could work? Let's add another tower or another element just here. Could this work? You can interact in museums or in open air spaces. What do you think? In out outdoor spaces. But why do we want to interact? Interacting or living the experience? There's a discussion about that. If this is the first time you're in Barcelona, there is an experience which is really nice for me in sensorial terms, which is going to La Boqueria Market. This is a traditional market full of colors and the smells and people moving around and how can I enrich that experience even further? So far, this technology at this stage, we will uh, later talk about the current situation, this was not enriching anything at that time in that environment. However, just as I could 
see the playfulness of it, other people thought, okay, what if I take elements such as uh, Arcquake and uh, I add augmented reality and I start shooting around uh, the streets of Barcelona? You've played that, haven't you? Uh, have you played the experience? Was that better than uh, the Quake on the computer? You jump. Another key point of augmented reality is the stability of images, both in markers and in geopositioning. You will see that in the technical part. Uh, when you have your position, if I move, the image will move too. But as soon as I lose the marker reference, as it has to calculate, maybe the image will disappear, it will be recreated. At this point, the image was vibrating too much. It was disappearing and coming back again. It was uncomfortable. It would generate, a, well, an ease while you were playing or working. Let's go back to the military. They continued working on this uh, with the same idea as Boeing. I need to train people for instance, to, re to receive a lot of information while they're fighting on uh, an aircraft fighter, and also to repair machines, which are all different between themselves, uh, different one f from one another. They're very expensive. They need to be repaired. Uh, and a lot of money has been uh, developed. Uh, a, lot, a lot of money has been invested in this, and a lot of the developments in this area have come to us. And there are many other examples. Here you see that the eyeglasses uh, are mm, the glasses are difficult to wear, they are cumbersome. And another problem that we had with the reality is that I need a uh, viewer, a viewer that will allow me to overlap that information in the military. They have uh, experiences with, uh, with um, low intensity lasers that project directly on uh, the retina. What screens uh, do you have available for, to you all the time? Your smartphones. The arrival of uh, smartphones, the arrival of uh, smartphones allowed uh, augmented reality developers uh, a communication channel uh, with all users, and that was massive. Google Glass will come, but before that, in 2009, we had a, a company called Liar. There are several which decided to add augmented reality to smartphones. For me, that was one of the, a, the most versatile and useful applications uh, of augmented reality. This was a launching campaign that they offered in Japan with a video clip where they create a, a character called the liar who's running in there to try and save someone who's running into trouble. And they said, OK. And how does uh, he help the person? Well, by using geopositioning information to help the person. Now the person is saved. Do you think that's a conventional video clip? It makes you laugh, doesn't it? It's in Japanese. It's rather freaky even to be a Japanese video clip. Around the same date, they launched the same app in Europe because this is an Amsterdam-based company. But the video in the case of Europe is a very different one. They say, we are the first company of AR on mobiles. So this is the reality, and here what it is about is to give us useful information for our journeys around the city, our movements around. Of course, I could look for this information on Google Maps or any other map-based app so that I don't need so much hardware and technology behind. But they think that they are enriching this experience. If you place your smartphone in front of the Sagrada Familia or any other building, you can enrich that experience. But 
well, we can pose the following question. Is this information truly enriching? Maybe not, because maybe at a moment in time, I just want to leave that experience as it is. But some other time, I can dwell on the information, on the details of that building, for example. Layer has grown, and we are approaching 2010 here. In 2010, I bought this magazine here. I don't know if you've heard about this magazine, Wallpaper. It's a trend uh, magazine. I bought it because they had this issue on AR. You see here the markers. When a trend-setting or trend uh, magazine starts to talk about AR as something that is already out there, well, they are trying to show the future here to us. You can have a look. And when I saw these, well, I suspected that this is already uh, widespread. Everyone knows about AR. They used one of the kits that we have mentioned here, and they used a webcam, not a mobile phone. 2010, not everybody had access to mobile phones, and mobile phones didn't have enough process processing potential to give us a good AR experience. So we had to activate the webcam, place the magazine in front of it. I compare the quality of printing of this magazine with what I saw on screen, and it was still a poor experience. 2011, let's move on. If you are a football supporter, I'm not very much into football, but we had this experience that was uh, for a very specific target audience. That was the football club Barcelona supporter. It could have been any other team, but a company was saying, well, thanks to AR, you can experience a very strong feeling. And what was the action about? This was, of course, advertised. The, the, the key thing here, the gist of it, was that you could hold the cup in your own hands. To me, that's a weird use of AR, and it's fit for thought also, because you, you're carrying around a carton, you put it up, you see the cup on the image, and there's a picture taken of you and the cup. It's weird, too many elements to end up with a picture of yourself holding up a cup. It's weird, and of course the technology was not very fine-tuned, and sometimes the cup would not appear on screen. When we break for coffee, I have placed some examples outside this room, and you will be able to check some of these examples with your own smartphone and see if it works or not. Another example of how this technology is being used as, uh, as a bait from the car industry, for example, a, f a trade show in Europe. This is a a car manufacturer. This is a trade show in which you go there to sell technology, a car. So why would you like to place a device between the audience and the car that might end up um, spoiling the feeling or the feelings that I would be feeling when seeing the car? This is an interesting example because here they really wanted to add information, to add value to the uh, fan of this car brand. We see um, the prototypes, the different parts of the car, the person can interact with the image, of course with the cup that we saw before, the interaction was little, uh, so it would be a nice experience, but you would probably not go back to it. But the car manufacturing industry has always been associated with technology. This is 2013, this is Volkswagen, and they talk about a concept car. And here we have an AR device, and if you pay attention to it, it highlights, well, or basically we, we notice the stability of the process of the image. If we compare it with the previous proposals, we saw superimposed images that were flickering in a way. So here we see the stability. Uh, the image is really still. Now he will move the device. This is key because 
as it goes with uh, human-like figures, it happens with reality. If it flickers, if the image is flickering, it really lowers the quality of our experience and we just do away with the device. But so far we have achieved a stability level that was unheard of. Um, not long ago, but still we have this challenge to get a true image as in geolocation we still have um, error margins uh, that are very wide and if we use uh, Wi-Fi we can reduce the, the error, error margin quite a lot. In the car manufacturing industry, I said that they always were associated with this type of technology. This is a 20, uh, 2007 experience. This is a, a conceptual one, not a real one. But it's about maintenance of the car, Rep reparation. These glasses would allow us to know which bolt to tighten or which uh, element or part of the car to repair. I'm not very much into cars, so that would be fantastic in my case. Actually, I broke my car stupidly not long ago because I forgot to replace or a, a part of it. This is not real, I repeat. This is just a conceptual model of what could be done. Okay, AR. As a strategic factor to make a difference. This example here, these are, this is a, a t-shirt brand and it is characterized by using different communication strategies with their audience. This is what they call guerrilla marketing. These are actions that would be, um, would be really make the news. We're not talking about Adidas or Nike, but they make the most of these AR toolkits. I think that we all have played um, different uh, board games. So here we've got a webcam, we've got the brand, the t-shirt. Not we, We've all played Knots and Crosses. This was the widespread example uh, in the net, so probably many of you came across it. To me, within the limitations of the technology back then, uh, the solution they get is a very good one. It offers you this game possibility, and in this type of game, you do not need extra realism. Okay, moving on. Things that happened very recently. In November 2013, I got um, an advertising from Wikitude, a company working not only on AR um, apps, but also they provide development toolkits that you can use on your mobile or laptop. Or for those of you wanting to keep it simple from a technological point of view, this last Christmas they offered the possibility to send a Christmas card to your friends with AR, just by uh, doing three necessary simple steps. In order to create your own Christmas card, you just had to register on their website. Out of curiosity, did anybody in the room send an AR Christmas card this last Christmas? Or are you planning to do that for next Christmas? It all depends, of course. So you just register, you choose the image that you will use as a reference to build a 3D image. Uh, 
there's a, a blank space uh, for you to upload your uh, 3D file and then you have to go to the web page and uh, show the Christmas card. It's a little bit difficult and slow because of course today most of the Christmas cards are digital and nobody will play around with the computer screen to see the 3D image. And it's not so different to the physical Christmas cards with music or cartoon um, structures. Do you send this type of Christmas cards with, um, you know, like uh, with a Christmas carol that plays when you open it? Do you, uh, you? You receive this type of Christmas card and do you place them on your desktop so that you can listen to the Christmas carol every once in a while? Well, we're in 2013 here. And of course, this is all I'm offered for Christmas time. I, I think this is not enough, really. We are lacking something. Thank God this is not the only AR experience, but it was the most long-standing one. This is a Catalan company that used a traditional Christmas figure of Catalonia, which is the Cagane. I will not tell you about the story of this character. But you've got an example outside in the lobby that you can check when we break for coffee. This was also a Christmas product. We could place our picture on the carané, on this Christmas figure, which is a log. Uh, you could customize the character. You could put the character in the real world, take a picture of it, and send it to a friend. And when the friend would receive this, could do the same in turn take the character, place his or her face on top of it, place it in the real world, and then take a picture of it and submit it again. Let, let's go back to Leia, this company that we saw that in 2007 and 2009 was offering these geolocation features in cities. Thanks to the technological advancements and the capacities, because many of you have already tablets, all of you have a smartphone, well, a mobile phone at least, and most of you are smartphones. What do they propose here? They propose a world in which AR improves our life. It significantly improves our lives. Let's see if you agree with them. Let's watch this clip. The minute I wake up, I can really enjoy AR. The information on the packaging, which is limited by the space and support, but it's not limited anymore. Magazines, any page of a magazine can be registered and through our camera, we can get additional information. You need an internet access. You can access videos on the web. So, how have we managed to live without this technology before? We could pose this question. This company, of course, makes a living out of this technology and it needs to convince us that it's so necessary. What do you think? Is it necessary for everything? Let's be specific here. Any case, any experience you've had in which you said, okay, so truly AR has meant an added value to me here. Apologies, but without a microphone, we cannot provide translation. You're touching upon an interesting element, and that is stage fright. Because if I go around the street with my device or I take out my mobile phone of my pocket to register a magazine page, or does any of you have an AR game on your mobile device? Any of you? Two, a couple of you? Do you play with them on your mobiles? Yes? 
don't worry, I won't be asking which is the game you've got, but we'll talk about games later. So they offer us these worlds, and I think that right now there are many possibilities opening up, but we still have to find the right application and see how to fill it with content. Yes. Bien. A ver, sí. Las empresas como Wikitude y Layer también Companies like Wikitude and Layer they also work along these lines uh, so that you can get additional information and you can register it. It's quite true that most of the examples I've shown so far because I've shown you the um, historical evolution and previous apps needed a constant reception of information and you had to have the camera in front of the object all the time. But going back to the lack of content I spot in many of these AR apps, in 2014 already I saw these ad of the Scottish buses with AR, but the AR they use is based on some labels you find on the bus, you register them with your mobile phone and you get different ads and different information. But this is similar to the ads that you get on a website or on a screen inside the bus. So, in my opinion, this is not really augmenting, increasing my perception of reality. AR has a strategic factor to communicate, to open up a communication channel. This is also a Catalan company which decided to launch uh, different children songs and they were thinking about an added value to the booklet that accompanies the CD with the children's songs. And they decided to go for AR in this uh, promotion. Let's see what they did. You've got this example outside also so that you can uh, test it on your own device. The image is quite stable. You see a tiny lake. This is a children um, song. If you've got children or nephews, nieces, brothers or sisters, uh, children books allowing to interact with them are a good possibility but here you just register the front page of the CD and the main character turns into an animated um, character and you can interact with this uh, with the scene and different an animals can come up on scene also I've tried it with children and it's it's quite they get hooked to it for some time but they never ask for it again it's just once that they enjoy it you can see the rainbow the forest is a party it said I think that all of us have had to study body bones and different body parts and we always looked for a reference to see where that bone was, the muscle, etc. Of course books um, 
offer a specific interaction with that information. But we always thought, what about having it in 3D? When I was studying fine art and we were sculpting, uh, it was very important to look for human body references. Many, for example, medical books would be very useful to us uh, and their treatment of this information. So here we've got this proposal. We see the skull, uh, an AR skull with which I can interact. I can choose the different bones. I can zoom in. You've got the example outside for you to test it. It's quite a stable image like the previous ones. But unlike the children character on which you clicked and things happened, here I can really interact with the image. I can turn it around, zoom in. But personally, I still have many problems to interact with this image. I get tired too easily. I still prefer the printed information. The image is clearer, more stable to me, because it really gets on my nerves still, the AR image. Sí. Bueno, puede que, puede que sea porque todavía no estamos nosotros preparados o la tecnología no... Maybe it's us, we are not prepared, or maybe it's technology. Technology hasn't been able to offer an added value and really augment the reality as we perceive it. simultaneous translation and we need to use the rolling mic in case we want all the remarks to be translated. I will keep it myself and just pass it around whenever you raise your hand to intervene. Vale. Tú lo controlas. Bien, ya tenemos micro para el... We've got the rolling mic for you to intervene and be translated. I was saying that, to me, uh, this technology, some years ago, well, nobody would know what AR was. You had to explain to everybody. And here we've got the Guinness Book of Records, and it is using AR. And this, to me, comes to show that, well, it is quite a widespread reality, this AR thing. IKEA. IKEA. Well, I'm interested here in this case because this is a really well-rooted company in a competing industry, and they don't use this technology because it's shocking, but rather because they want to awake different feelings in their customers. So IKEA is proposing an AR feature in their new 2014 catalog. And here we can interact with it in a very special manner. This is not a simple catalogue where I place the different um, furnitures on the space and I see how it will look like. No, they propose um, these AR to be creative. So we can create more or less surprising images using these markers and just upload them uh, to the internet and post them on the social media. This is the true goal that IKEA is pursuing here. So you can have these on your mobile devices. Should you have it, would you start to be creative? Would you use it? What, what comes, I mean, what crosses your mind? What would you do with it? We have seen different examples on screen, but what would you do with this AR feature? In this case, I think it's a useful idea because you 
can't really think about the decoration of your room, the distribution of the furniture, how you will be using the space. Anybody else sees this AR feature as useful? Well, you are at your place, at home, and of course you're not ashamed of using your mobile device at home in the coziness of your place. Any other opinion? Anybody else sees an added value to these? A student is reading some material and he's reading about a concept. He can illustrate the concept using animations, certain things, relationships, figures. Like high school, the sample that you uh, can see, high school, like this. Yeah, something like this. In education, it's true. We've got videos and we can support the videos with AR features. But I want to stick to two ideas that, has, uh, that have come up here, which are very interesting. First, the creative side to it. It allows us to interact. And IKEA here plays around with a current trend, which is the do-it-yourself DIY. I don't know if any of you are into gardening or knitting or baking cupcakes, which is a real trend today, too. But this is a trend, the DIY, do-it-yourself. And IKEA bases its business strategy on this phenomenon that if you participate, if you get engaged in something, you will feel it as your own and, well, you will relate more to the company, to the brand. That's why many of us go to IKEA feeling like design, um, interior designers, and, well, we don't feel frightened of doing these. We, we feel more fulfilled. When you implement AR here, IKEA wants us to relate to the company, to participate, to really feel part of the project. Okay, what happens if I offer AR to creative people? Not long ago, I saw this book on a bookshop. Okay, too many devices in my hands. Different graphic designers present their works in this book, and they use AR to do that. You, you have these examples outside too. You, you'll be able to check them during the break. But in the case of IKEA, creativity was paramount. But in this object here, in this book I've got here, apart from observing the works on paper or through a video that, is, um, that appears when I register the page or going to the web page that is linked to the code, there is no other interaction element. So I, I would go for the book. But the AR support that is given to this book is not interesting to me. If you check it during the break, please tell me later if the AR possibility of this book um, adds anything to it. If you've got an iPhone, the app is for free. You can download it and we'll be able to check different web pages that are linked to the book. In 2011, I went to Portugal and there was um, a, a phone uh, campaign with different posters using AR. Here we see this girl in front of the poster and she's looking at something. We don't really know what she's looking at. I don't know if you were in Portugal at that time and saw this campaign. It's quite odd that she is the only one uh, standing in front of the poster. There is not, no competition to stand in front of the poster. The microphone, please. So how do you know that you have to use your device and register the poster? It is set um, through the different TV campaigns we really need to use the rolling mic if we want the remarks to be translated. We, st we still have stage fright, as I said before. We feel ashamed of standing in front of a poster and registering it with our device. 
nosotros estamos perdidos en una ciudad. In a city, or when we want to locate ourselves, that's when we take out the phone and then we try to find something about it. And we've also, we'll also do that if it provides some further information about an element that I'm really interested in. For instance, some artistic piece or an architectural element of advertising, when we avoid it already, this is like banners on websites, uh, we try to block them out. That's tough. Aún así, yo hay muchos vales de descuentos que estos que regalan por la calle que ya no los hay. There are many, many, for instance, discount vouchers that I don't even look at when they distribute them in, uh, in the streets. Even if you give them presents, uh, it's difficult uh, to get them to interact with you. It's, it's hard to hook them up. Samsung, Samsung is another company uh, where they use augmented reality to see the impact that having their TV screen at home will have. Nos imprimimos la marca. Print the marker. And we can place that marker on the wall or on a shelf. And then watch television there. Las pulgadas de mi próximo televisor para que ver si caben en... The number of uh, inches the new screen will have to see if it fits in. Y la compra. The purchase. ¿Os parece práctico alguien que vaya? Would you think that's practical if you're going to buy a television set or if you've bought one recently? Would it have been useful? I think this is like visiting a website or a video clip, watching a video clip for uh, as an ad. But what's funny is that uh, you will see what it looks like on your wall, but Do you really want that? Bueno, podría llegar a ser útil, pero useful, yes. But you need to print it and to work hard just in order to to see what that uh, TV screen is going to look like on your wall. On your wall, yes. We're actually going back to the beginning, as uh, what we said with that poster. Do we really want to invest so much work? Uh, you first need the. Uh, smartphone then we need the markers uh, when will be we will be willing to invest so much time in the case of ikea the price was uh, seeing our creativity and the result of those creative images and so on but here i can't really play much more than seeing what the television will look like uh, on my wall i could just go into the shop and check that out or check that out on a website and not doing so much Samsung offers a product and maybe the cost of having to download that just to watch one TV set is not worthwhile, but maybe a uh, company such as Media Mark where they have many different products uh, and seeing them in your own house, uh, that could be useful. I would tend to agree with you to a certain extent. But for each product, you need to print your marker. If it's just one single piece of paper for the whole uh, media mark catalog, for instance, that would be different. The ideal thing would be, okay, here and this element from your mobile phone alone, that's where we're going. But so far, the technology is available, and at the workshop as well, is uh, geared at discussing the different possibilities, work on them, and see what options we have available. Next quick. As Quick is running a campaign. It's addressed to children, to children, and in the points of sale, you have televisions, or you can go there with your iPad, and I will see some little animals moving around. It's similar to what we saw with the video clip. The idea is that as soon as they get home, they can either get uh, their computer connected, and with their webcam, they will watch those little animals jumping. In 
highly competitive sectors when this technology, if the technology were effective, we would see that in all supermarkets, in all the shelves. The fact that it's not there, well, it means that the experience is still poor. However, there are many companies that which have seen businesses in there already. This is uh, for advertising, uh, augmented reality applied to advertising. We'll see an example there. As experiences, uh, some days ago, I read something. Nestle is working on a vintage uh, packaging line. And they're doing that for people who have memory problems and diseases such as uh, where they've seen that having memories from their childhood uh, can be helpful. So you can uh, download these old style packages, uh, this vintage packaging. You can just wrap around uh, the current packaging and, uh, and then you can alter reality and that has uh, not an educational but a um, um, health purpose. AR could be really useful. If, it's, if the quality is good enough, uh, you could create this um, friendly environment that would be useful for treatment. But let's now move on to cultural heritage, museums and culture. France is uh, one of the benchmarks where I've seen outstanding experiences. One of them is the recreation of spaces. As we've seen before, we always need a device. Uh, they, 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 they create this, uh, or they offer, sorry, this screen so that you can turn around. They're big enough. And in that way, you can see the space. I'm not interacting with it. I'm only receiving information so far. And another reality where this, another example where the screen is even bigger. You go to a mall, there's a huge screen, and people are invited to interact with objects. And there are some other elements here bringing together what we've seen already. We were talking about advertising out in the street. It's hard uh, for people to stop here and uh, do something. We then talked about what happens at home, where I'm not afraid of uh, the way I look or if people will laugh, will, will laugh at me. This is a, a playful area. This is a supermarket or a mall, a place where I go and spend the day. It's not somewhere. <laughs> It's not somewhere where I go to work. So I have this predisposition to interact with the environment. And it's easy to lure me into something like this happening. And then we're there in a group. It's a social event. One of the reasons why we succeeded so much it was, was because it was devised to work or to play in a group, whereas PlayStations or Xbox are worth just thought for one single player uh, locked up in a room, spending hours and hours uh, working alone on that. Just like the Wii, this type of actions are one-off things. And no supermarket will have this uh, forever. Once we have experienced uh, that and you've played with animals, there isn't much more you can do about it. changing the type of uh, screens. This uh, company, EO Vision, which works in maps, has got a monitor which shows the Earth as a 3D object. The Earth and other worlds as well, of course. And the object, after technology development and the unsuccess, the little success it had, because well, they thought that the universities and schools would buy it and people would rent it out, they were um, 
renting this out for promotions for anyone who would be interested in having this round screen. Do you think, or can, can you come up with any ideas uh, why would you would use this round screen, this spherical screen? The key in museums is that they usually have uh, this stock of works and documents that they can't show because they have limited space. And that's where augmented reality can, has a lot of room to play with. It can provide added value on an object which is being exhibited and provide information which can be hidden at the moment and we can access information that they also, and we can also access materials that they have at the moment in the, in the warehouses catalogs with augmented reality in front of the book as compared to the book uh, that didn't contribute uh, that didn't was, was not an improvement as compared to the designers and here I would have a catalog and here I would have the, the pieces of work exhibited in the museum and on that you can overlay some information such as the structure the composition of the artist uh, historical data data on colors This one seems interesting to you, doesn't it? This is an example of an interesting application. It's very catchy. It's true. What they're offering to me now is the structure of, for instance, of the the layout of the of the composition or the perspective. You could have just placed on top of it a transparency. Yes, but besides what we're seeing, you can add things such as, for instance, sound and audio guide to find out more about the author, about the painting. That's something you can't solve overlaying uh, uh, a transparency. But the problem we have about museums is that if you offer this to a museum, they will tell you that uh, they don't want it or they don't need it. I think you're wrong there. Now we have the constraint of uh, money. They don't have that much money to invest, but they are interested in that, and they do have the need to explain and to offer everything that they have in their warehouses or to have more didactic exhibitions and so on. For instance, La Caixa Savings Bank has got a long-standing tradition of heavily, inf he heavily information loaded exhibitions. But the problem is when I offer that information and at what point, because people go to an exhibition and with what is being shown in the exhibition, they feel overwhelmed already. Others uh, uh, will be more willing to to receive that. People, for instance, before going to an exhibition, some people before visiting a country will will gather information in advance in order to be more prepared for that. Other people simply just uh, receive what they have there. Another option that uh, seems interesting to me are actions. Artistic actions uh, in the city, for instance, uh, you have to travel around the city uh, to experience that. This is not an extra on the typical information that you have uh, from museums, but it, this is already part of the artistic work, uh, that augmented reality that you're being offered there. Some uh, companies, for instance, Wikitude, which offer that Christmas card, they want to offer that augmented um, reality. They joined EO Vision, which is uh, the company that made those uh, Earth globes, and now they offer a development kit which is geared at museums. 
based on images with a piece of work in front of you, not with a code. You can overlay extra information, audio, videos, uh, history about the artist, uh, you name it. And uh, probably when the day, at some point in time, they can add games to make uh, more playful this whole experience. EO Vision will now publish a book that's their maps where they apply augmented reality offered by Wikitude. This is basically the same system that we could have uh, in the city with geopositioning data, where you have uh, geolocation data, data about your environment, and so on. But this is based on the pictures that your vision has about cities, uh, different maps from different periods of time. Things which, uh, if you put uh, them on a book, you won't have problems in visualizing all of that, not only visualizing it, but also holding that much information. Here you are linked, uh, you can link up to uh, an, a feature in National Geographic and so on. This is a much more interesting experience, in my opinion, than that offered by the designers when they present their work. Mediated reality, sometimes this is enriching our experience, but sometimes it can also make it poorer. This is a picture, this is Barcelona. These lines here on the pavement are theoretically to point out, to show to mm, blind people uh, where the bus stop is so that they can go and stand in front of the bus stop. But for instance, here's a tree. We've lost focus. We wanted to solve the problem to the blind person so that he or she could get to the to the um, bus. And well, uh, uh, the bricklayer has uh, has uh, done his work properly, but some, somewhere along the line, some, somewhere along the way, some people, someone got lost and lost focus. Let me sh tell you about an experience that I had in Madrid. This uh, is the collection of the Casa de Alba. This is a family, a uh, very important family from Spain, and they have important pieces of art, works of art by different artists. And well, uh, the Autonomous Community of Madrid had an exhibition. It wasn't a cheap exhibition whatsoever. and. Uh, uh, museums are not interested. Well, one of the keys to lure people into the client, into the museum is that your audio guide uh, was going to be a Nintendo 3DS. I'm sure that many of you have heard about that. Did you go to that exhibition? Any, was anyone at that exhibition? Before I speak, how did you, what, what was your experience like? I was not able to use the audio guide because there weren't that many, they were all taken. So I only saw the exhibition, but I couldn't use the audio guide. I saw that on television. And as I was going to Madrid, I thought it was interesting, in interesting to see. So I decided to go, but I didn't have the opportunity to use the audio guide. And what you saw around you, what did you think about that, about people using the audio guide? People were actually lost in seeing all the information they were. Uh, flabbergasted, uh, they had, uh, they were wearing headsets and so on. They were, they were um, baffled with the, with the device. They were lost in thoughts and absorbed in that, in that experience. I refused to take the audio guide. I went to the exhibition, of course, but I just walked walked around watching what people were doing. Let me show you the video clip. They, this is the experience that they were selling us. That was what was supposed, uh, what, what was supposed to enrich our experience. How many of you have a Nintendo 3DS? And do you feel satisfied with the 3D part that it offers? No, no, yes, more or less, so and so. Well, there aren't that many so that we can draw any overall conclusions, but in any case, for me, 
maybe it's because of my age or my experience, uh, being in front of a Goya painting and uh, seeing people just watch the Nintendo 3DS uh, is not a great contribution to that piece of art, of art. It was probably not enriching that experience, and people were actually uh, absorbed in the DS. People were walking like this, and that was spectacular for me, just instead of watching the paintings. The television, uh, of course, uh, talked a lot about that because they were using a Nintendo 3DS, and journals and magazines talked about this uh, guide, a Nintendo 3DS in the Casa de Alba, but nobody was talking about uh, the importance of the works uh, or uh, what the dialogue of the works were proposing. All of that was trivial. The important thing was the technology being used uh, to walk around the exhibition. Isn't that funny? 2013, when, where smartphones are so uh, prevailing, why did they use Nintendo 3DS? Because of money. 3DS was paying for, was sponsoring that exhibition. It wasn't so much advertising. Nintendo offers guides in Paris. I don't know if it's at, at the Louvre Museum. They have different guides. Nintendo, as part of their business strategy, is also aimed at culture. For other consoles, uh, it's only games and playing. Nintendo is offering also the cultural side of it. So that's why they try to relate to museums, to experiences that are addressed uh, to the mainstream population and so on. That was strategic for Nintendo. And then Nintendo 3DS. Nintendo has now published uh, the 2S as if it was a step forward. And the step forward was uh, removing the 3D from the console. Well, I haven't had that much experience with Nintendo 3DS, but I get dizzy too. But I also have eyesight problems. I have a lazy eye. And when I go to a 3D cinema, I also get dizzy. So I almost get dizzy everywhere. So I'm not a good, um, a good reference point. But for players, uh, if talking to players who they're a bit disappointed, and uh, you need to be holding the Nintendo, uh, the screen on a given position, because otherwise, if you are deviate from that, uh, then um, you lose the 3D. And well, I think that uh, the fact that it was it didn't work so well has been proved by the fact that they have now published or uh, launched uh, the 2D again. Lego, let's talk about Lego. They've been working with education, new technologies, and uh, children for so many years. And they have this experience in Berlin where they try to explain to blind people a period of German art and German expressionism specifically, where colors uh, play a very relevant role. experience, if I were to uh, take the definition of AR, uh, strictly speaking, it wouldn't fit in. But if we see that we miss some of the data input somehow, this could be an enriching experience. Uh, because with this blind children, when they had extra information, they turned uh, well, that information into, for instance, free creations and also figurative horses. We need to be able to break free from technology in order to reach something which is more conceptual and which is actually telling stories. 
Augmented reality as a strategy to make visible a number of elements, things that we would usually overlook. Let's go back to culture. Let's go back to France. <laughs> they offer a mobile phone service. And they will turn the experience of visiting the city into a discovery, a joint discovery experience, because they take for granted that you're going to be accompanied. Traveling in time, traveling back in time. After having seen this, how many of you will download an augmented reality guide for Barcelona? One? Two? There are some. They do exist. I think we're not, <laughs> we're not generating enough, enough enthusiasm for you to jump out and go and get your AR guide. A Crossair is a corporation created in uh, the wake of these mobile technologies and this uh, uh, idea of uh, adding AR geopositioning and this key need that we have to, to solve this problem of feeling we are lost in the city. And this is interesting to me because it worked very well with the way we interact. Uh, when the mobile uh, phone is flat, it shows uh, one plane of the city with a key directions that I could take when uh, it's held vertically, I start seeing data about what's around me. And in a simple way, without too many interferences, I can start finding things. Across Air does have a guide for Barcelona. I am not sure whether you have to pay for it or not, or if it's free. As a corporation, You've seen that uh, it wasn't uh, that recent. They offer not only location of elements, but they start interacting, for instance, with uh, social media and social networks with the information. Uh, we see the blogs, for instance, icons there that you could link in with.
Aquí me pregun gustaría preguntaros también, gente que... Si tú has viajado a diferentes países, ¿te gusta viajar con tu iPad? ¿Es eso lo que haces? And when you are in the middle of a square, you take it out, you start registering information and looking for additional information. Anyone in the room who does that? Well, I've seen that in Barcelona. Actually, I feel I, I refrain myself because I don't know the origin of this information. Um, Probably it's just advertising uh, if the app is for free. So if they point at a specific restaurant that is close to the place where I'm standing, maybe it's not the right one for me. I don't know. This is the my feeling. I think that most people just don't do it because they don't feel safe because of the safety of this technology. But it's quite true that the contents that we access, how do we know that they are reliable contents or it's just advertising? Because it, if it's for free, maybe it's just an advertising that is biased. And this happens in all the web pages. And of course, there is a series of elements that can help us to rely on that information. Of course, we trust our friends most of all, and that's why um, social media are a big source of content for these companies. And it's really about information that has been given by our relatives and friends, people we know, that, and we know that we share interests and hobbies with them. So it's not a preset um, information without any label of quality. There is another interesting data, and that is that when there is a company behind, a museum, for example, behind that content, well, that's the label of quality. If it's the Louvre in Paris or the Reina Sofia in Madrid, I really trust that information. I, I know that it's been manufactured or gathered by a museum. In the case of Nintendo, yeah, it's a different case. But the trust is gained by the name, by the brand behind this information, because they will not be telling me that the Goya painting was painted by uh, Nintendo Japan. I understand his prejudice. To what extent do I know that the information I'm getting is just advertising? But it's also true, nevertheless. I'm, I'm quite critical with that exhibition. I didn't like it that much. But it's true that you can gain uh, that trust. And many of these platforms are already looking for content in social media. So the content is not manufactured by them, but rather gathered uh, from the social media. Let's see how the Google Glasses will uh, interact with all these elements and bearing in mind all the data that Google has about ourselves, if they will just share us with uh, advertising or whether they will provide useful information. Son los creadores de la empresa, nos presentan el producto. The creators of the company, they are presenting the product, but it's just uh, more information that goes through my acquaintances, and I really trust them. Aquí también, ya que estamos tanta gente, ¿cuántos...? We are so many. How many of you go to a restaurant because a guide, because you've read it on a guide. Do you trust guides and which is your guide of preference? And how many of you look for information on fora, on the internet? Look for good restaurants in Barcelona and have you had um, satisfying experiences better than when you relied on a guide? Maybe on guides. 
Well, it's very touristy, and you have the feeling that you're going to not such an authentic place. And if you look into a forum, you have information given by locals, uh, more updated information, and you probably end up in more authentic places, and that's what you look for when you travel. Anyone else willing to share an experience with us? I've combined both uh, the printed guides and fora, because I remember one example in Malaga, somebody had recommended a very good restaurant, and thanks to a forum, I learned that the restaurant had closed not long ago because of some tax issues. And if I had relied only on the printed guide, well, I would have ended uh, in front of a closed restaurant. I have checked uh, one restaurant on YouTube through an AR video, and you would be served uh, a fish. And thanks to a barcode, through your mobile device you, device, you could know where that fish where, was caught and who caught it. You could see all the related information with the fish that you were about to eat. That's another working line. It's to trace back the origin of food, people who are very much into organic food, etc. Going back to the restaurant topic and the information and trust given by Fora, I think that in Fora, you are spoken to in your own language. They say, um, prawns there are just shit, nothing. So in, in other sources, probably you get biased information, the information that is paid for and manufactured by the restaurant. Uh, whereas in Fora, you speak to other customers and you can speak um, very plainly. You can say, look, I have little money. I want to eat just one. Um, one serving and, well, you get more reliable, reliable information. Regarding what he just said, I think that we encounter a problem here. In TripAdvisor, for example, there are customers who blackmail the hotel. They, they say, look, um, I've booked a room with your hotel and please offer me something for free, otherwise I will um, criticize you on the net. Inverting the system or being subversive is quite a human characteristic. We just like to break rules. Someone said blackmailing hotels is a phenomenon. Yes, of course, it's out there. So what is real, after all? What is the reliable information? I think that there is a self-regulation of the system, as in Wikipedia. At the beginning, everyone was so afraid that every everything would be lies. And, of course, um, history would be distorted. And, well, after all, history is written by human beings. What happened in the case of Wikipedia is that the positive side of, uh, of it is more powerful than the destructive um, people regarding Wikipedia. And Google and other companies place tools so that there is a self-regulation of the system. If somebody is blackmailing a hotel or a restaurant, well, this is in a way solved along the way because other people will say, no, this hotel is fine. And these really striking cases are, well, are made apparent at the end. So I think that one of the keys in terms of the content that can be offered for, to us uh, by these apps regarding um, things to do in a city have to do with social media. And actually, the companies working with AR try to link it up with the social media. Another important field of action of AR is medicine. We saw that Boeing uh, would use it to superimpose information uh, regarding uh, the different um, flight connections or in the car industry or in the military. This is a medical um, platform, a health platform. This is an endoscopy and uh, well, we are traveling through the human body and we see superimposed data. So this is a very good application of AR to me. Before moving on to AR in order to be productive, so in order to increase our productivity, 
I would propose to break for coffee. Okay. Or, well, take a coffee or practice AR with the examples I've placed outside in the corridor for you to check the stability or instability of the image. The cases you've got outside are very recent ones, so you will be looking at um, novel technology. If you don't have a device, I've got two devices with me. You can use them for you to check them. And I've got this book if you want to check it out and interact straight away with the book. And after the break, I will give you more examples and you will be able to download them on your mobiles. See you in 20 minutes.